Welcome to this uh, press conference. Today, we would like to uh, share with you our medical plan to manage our COVID-19 pa patients. Our priority is to ensure that our patients receive appropriate care and reduce complications and mortality to the extent we possible. In achieving this, we optimize our resources, including manpower resources, to prevent our healthcare system from being overwhelmed. So far, the majority of the cases have had relatively mild diseases or no symptoms, and they do not require extensive medical intervention. About 30% require closer medical observation due to their underlying health conditions or because of old age. A very small number require ventilation support and care in the intensive care unit. Given the different needs of our patients, we have set up a range of facilities to match their medical needs. The majority who have mild or no symptoms, as well as those who have largely recovered from their illnesses, are cared for in community care facilities, such as the Singapore Expo, under the care of a medical team, supported by technology tools, such as vital signs monitoring. Those who require additional observation are admitted to the hospital and those with severe conditions are cared for in the ICU. Studies have shown that patients who remain well at day 14 of illness are likely to remain well, uh, likely to remain clinically stable and generally do not require any further medical care. They no longer need to remain in the CCF or community care facilities. These patients may be transferred to a community recovery facility, or CRF, which does not need to have medical services. We have rapidly expanded our CCF community care facility capacity. We now have 10,000 capacity and aim to scale up to 20,000 by mid-June. On community recovery facility, we now have a capacity of over 2,000 beds and we intend to ramp up our CRF capacity to more than 10,000 beds by end June. On manpower, we adopt a two-pronged approach, tapping on private sector healthcare professionals, retirees and volunteers, and leveraging technology. The Ministry of Health has sought the support of our healthcare professionals in the private sector and encouraged them to join the SG Healthcare Corps. Since it was launched, around 3,000 healthcare professionals across all job groups have signed up. We deeply appreciate their contribution and willingness to come forward. Moving forward, Ministry of Health will expand SG Healthcare Corps to include more healthcare professionals as well as non-healthcare professionals. We are also redeploying manpower from industries affected by COVID-19 to enable them to take on new roles at our hospitals such as our collaboration with the Singapore Airlines. We have been able to mobilize and ramp up our medical facilities and support in a short time because of the whole of society approach. I want to thank every individual, group and company who has stepped forward to help fight COVID-19. To our healthcare workforce, both public and private, as well as the SG Healthcare Corps, who are fighting at the front line of the battle we are grateful for your selfless, selflessness and commitment. I also want to thank many non-healthcare partners who have also stepped forward. It is this spirit of unity and resilience in the face of adversity that will see Singapore emerge stronger from this crisis. Thank you. Now, I'd like to invite EMS Professor Kenneth Mark to give an update on the medical side. Thank you very much, Minister. As of the 28th of April, 2020, 12 p.m., the Ministry of Health has pre preliminarily confirmed an additional 528 cases of COVID-19 infection in Singapore. The vast majority of these cases remain work permit holders who are residing in foreign worker dormitories, and eight cases are single citizens or permanent residents. Uh, we continue to work through the details of the cases, and a further update will be provided via the press release that the Ministry of Health will release later tonight. Thank you. Now I'd like uh, to invite um, Minister Lawrence Wong to say a few words. Um, good evening. 
Minister Gan has just articulated the comprehensive medical strategy we have put in place uh, to tackle COVID-19. Executing this strategy and tackling the virus really puts a huge demand on space. Uh, that may be not an issue for many countries, but in a small, compact city-state like Singapore, these demands for space are quite challenging. And that's why it requires quick and innovative solutions for us to quickly put together all the space that's required to deal with this virus. Uh, we need space for quarantine. We need space for returnees coming back from overseas. We need space for isolation facilities. We need space for recovering patients. Uh, a lot of space that we really have to put together in quite a short time. And besides the physical requirements, it's also the management um, that's needed to ensure that these spaces are well run, that there are adequate infection controls, medical support, security arrangements, whole range of things that are needed. And that's why uh, I would like to reiterate our appreciation for the private sector partners who have stepped forward and helped us mount this very swift response in coming, to, coming up with all the solutions that we had now have put in place in order to deal comprehensively uh, with COVID-19. Uh, there are many private sector stakeholders who have stepped forward. We've acknowledged them in the statement. There are many volunteers as well who have uh, stepped forward and offered their services. And indeed, that's the spirit that will enable us to overcome the virus together. Allow me to say a few words in Mandarin. Today, I want to talk to you about the medical strategy to take care of the COVID-19 patients. In order to ensure that the patients can get medical treatment, we use the patients' needs to make the medical treatment and resources to make the medical treatment. Now, most of the COVID-19 patients are relatively mild or no symptoms. 在大约百分之三十的的的,的这些病人当中，他们需要进一步的医疗观察，主要是因为他们可能有一些潜在的健康问题，或者是年龄较大的问题。有极少数的病人需要加护病房的治疗，来也是也有一些病人也可能需要呼吸上的一些补助，所以我们有不同的设施来应付他们不同的医疗的需求。大部分的病人会在社区护理设施 （community care facility） 那里得到医疗团队的照顾。我们也会应用科技来补助相关的医疗需求，比如观察病人的体温等等。需要进一步观察的病人会送到医院来收到呃料理。病情严重的，则会在加护病房里面接受治疗。我们也观察到，病人在病发后的第十四天，如果一般上情况良好的话，之后应该会保持稳定，一般上不需要进一步的医疗护理。这些病人就可能会被送到社区康复设施 （Community Recovery Facility）。我们最近已经迅速的扩充了社区护理设施，计划到了六月中可以容纳多达两万名的病人。社区康复设施方面呢 ，Community Recovery Facility， 我们目前有超过两千个床位，并且计划在六月底之前增加到超过一万个床位。我们也一直都在为我们的医疗团队增添人手。我们双管齐下，一方面借助私人领域的医疗护理员、专员、退休人士和志愿者的力量，另一方面则是善用科技。卫生部之前呼吁私人领域的医疗护理专员提供资源，鼓励他们加入新加坡医疗护理志愿团队 （SG Healthcare Corps） 的行列。目前我们已经大约有三千名的医疗护理专员响应我们的号召，我们非常感激他们所做出的贡献以及献身的精神。接着下来，卫生部会扩大新加坡医疗护理志愿团队，纳入更多。护理专员以及没有医疗护理背景的其他人士，某些工作领域被疫情严重影响，我们也从这些领域调动人员到医院的一些工作岗位
。目前我们已经和新加坡航空公司合作，进行这些人员的调动。我们能够在短时间内动员各个医疗设施，得到很大的援助，是政府机构和私人领域和全体社会共同努力的结果。我也要感谢挺身而出、参与对抗病毒行动的每一个人、公司和各个集团。对于公共和私人领域的医疗护理团队以及志愿团体，你们无私奉献的精神，让我们感激不尽。我们在逆境中能够团结一心，就能够带领新加坡度过这个危机。谢谢大家。And now open the floor for questions. Thank you, panelists. Members of the media will now begin the Q&A. Please remember to use the raise hand button if you would like to ask a question. Also, please only ask one question to allow for more to participate during the Q&A. We have the first question from Timothy from ST. Timothy, please state your question, please. Thank you, Ministers. Um, I'd like to ask, what are our plans to boost our ICU capacity? Are there any target numbers and where will we get enough equipment to take the ventilators from? Thank you. Thank you. It's a very good question. In fact, the hospitals are now in the process of ramping up uh, ICU capacity uh, in line with the rising number of uh, patients and the expected number of uh, patients in ICU. I would ask uh, uh, Kenneth to elaborate on the uh, plans that we have in putting in place the ramp up capacity on ICU. Thank you very much, uh, Minister, and thank you very much, uh, Timothy, as well, for the question. Indeed, we have been uh, pick, taking active steps to increase our ICU capacity. We've, we've done this in a variety of different ways. Uh, first of all, we've uh, uh, made sure that those who actually require uh, coming into the ICU, uh, we've, we've uh, asked all the hospitals to reduce the number of uh, non-urgent uh, clinical uh, work that they're doing, and that will allow uh, ICU beds therefore to be properly reserved for those who, in fact, who truly require this, particularly for those from, uh, who are infected with COVID-19 infection. Secondly, we've been working with various hospitals. They have plans uh, uh, to, uh, to uh, activate uh, various wards that they have uh, and convert them into both negative pressure isolation wards as well as ICUs. And that process of, uh, of, of conversion uh, has, in fact, uh, been taking place over the last few weeks. Um, they've expanded their capacities already from the original uh, capacity at least twice now. And we continue to uh, uh, complete that conversion works in the rest of the hospitals to, to increase our capacity. Uh, we've also, on the back end, been uh, uh, procuring additional equipment to resource and make sure that these uh, additional beds are properly uh, uh, equipped with the relevant facilities to support uh, care of the critically ill uh, patient. That includes the provision of additional uh, ventilators uh, and other monitoring equipment that they actually require. Uh, and uh, some additional procurement efforts that still continue to make sure that uh, we maximize our potential as far as ICU capacity is concerned. The manpower uh, that we need to raise to support the uh, expanded ICU facilities continues uh, and is in progress at this point in time. We have uh, asked all uh, uh, hospitals uh, who have uh, ICU trained staff uh, who, but deployed in other roles to uh, consider redeploying them back into uh, clinical duties to support uh, these expanded ICUs. And those who, uh, in fact, have previously been trained and proficient in, in ICU care but now have been deployed in other roles also undergo a refresher training to make sure that they retain their competencies. We've invited those who have uh, left nursing, for example, and uh, gone into other careers, invited them to consider coming back in uh, to the nursing workforce, and we also will be providing additional training to make sure that they uh, are ready to take on these added roles if uh, they, we need to fill up these additional ICU beds. So that work is in progress, and the work continues to make sure that we have sufficient capacity in anticipation for any future demand. Thank you. I should add that uh, I always want to take this opportunity to remind ourselves that uh, while we have sufficient capacity at, at the moment, I do want to preserve the buffer that we have and we must never take the healthcare capacity for granted. It's still important for us to uh, 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 observe the safe distancing and the circuit breaker measures to reduce the number to the extent possible. And even the cases in the dormitories, we also have a, a plan 
to address these issues, to make sure that we manage the cases properly, to minimize the risk of complications from these uh, patients, and to also to reduce the mortality. So I think these are our key objectives from, our, from a medical point of view. So uh, ICU capacity, while we have sufficient, we should never take it for granted, and we should continue to ramp up as much as we can and to reduce complications as much as we can. Thank you, panelists. The next question will be from Stefania from FT. Stefania, please ask your question. Yes, hello. Um, I want to, wanted to ask a question about the foreign workers um, uh, that were uh, discussed by Professor Mack earlier in the um, technical briefing. So those foreign workers in the dorms that are symptomatic and that you're isolating as soon as you can um, and not uh, testing them uh, yet, um, how many are there? And even if you don't have a specific number, even just ballpark would be useful. Um, and where are you isolating? Them. Uh, I don't have actually a number uh, to give you at this point in time. Uh, we're actually co uh, compiling those numbers. Uh, the joint task force that uh, uh, helps us with our dormitory operations is in the process also compiling some of these numbers, and we hope uh, to make that available to you uh, as soon as we can. Uh, they are once they are, in fact, presenting themselves to the medical post and we identify them as having uh, respiratory symptoms, uh, we um, then subsequently uh, assess them in terms of what we think their risk is uh, for, for their illness. And those, for example, who are much older foreign workers or whom we regard as perhaps having a high risk uh, of, of, uh, of having symptoms and deteriorating, uh, we want to be particularly vigilant in those cases and we transfer them to our hospitals uh, for further monitoring and further care. Uh, others are isolated, and uh, where they are isolated will depend on the facilities that are available. So for example, if there are uh, facilities available within the dormitories that allows for them to be properly looked after and isolated separate from uh, those who are well and without any symptoms, then uh, we would uh, be accommodating them in these facilities. Uh, others might uh, be uh, looked after within our community care facilities, which Minister has mentioned earlier as well. Thank you, DMS. The next question will be from Sharon from Business Times. Sharon, please ask your question. Hi, um, I was wondering for the community care facilities, you mentioned that there are about 10,000 bed spaces at the Resort Singapore Expo and Changi Exhibition Centre the target to double to 20,000 by mid-June. So where will the, the new bids be housed? Will they be at the same? Some of them will include the existing sites that we have already uh, identified, including uh, Changi, uh, including uh, Singapore Expo. And uh, these capacity are being expanded at this, uh, as, we are talk as we are speaking. But there will also be new sites that are being uh, identified in different parts of Singapore. And we will announce these sites uh, when the, the, they are prepared and they are ready. So progressively, we will we'll share with the Singaporeans where these sites are. And they are going to be similar in nature where we have space where we convert uh, existing space into community care facilities as well as uh, community recovery facilities. Thank you, Minister. The next question is from Cheryl from CNA. Cheryl, please state your question. Hey, um, is the task force looking at clotting issues related to COVID? Uh, as this may redefine how MOH uh, counts COVID-related deaths, because I think there were a few cases that may have fallen through the cracks. Uh, yes, indeed. Um, we've uh, also uh, and, um, we're also aware of. Uh, research and, and articles and information coming out uh, from other countries about uh, the possibility that uh, uh, COVID-19 patients who are seriously ill may also have uh, problems with their clotting. Uh, and uh, it may also be contributing to complications that they may uh, they see. So the National Center for Infectious Diseases, as well as uh, the other hospitals, are actually looking to this. They've been uh, doing various uh, uh, studies also for their patients to determine whether indeed this is, uh, this is the case for our local population. Uh, but at this point in time, because they haven't completed their study, uh, they have not, in fact, announced any particular findings uh, as to whether, indeed, these are the same observations that we see within our local Singapore patient pool. Uh, as soon as uh, they are ready, they've completed the study and they're able to announce, we'll also try and uh, release that information to you. 
Thank you, DMS. Our next question is from Sing Hui from SCMP. Sing Hui, please ask your question. Hello, hi. Um, so, do we know, can you give us a sense of how much it costs to build up all these facilities and with this expanded capacity, how many active infected patients can we handle at one shot? Um, the capacity of these facilities, if you talk about the care facilities and the recovery facilities, uh, we have highlighted and explained the capacity that we have today and what we are building up towards. Uh, the care facilities and the recovery facilities space aside, the difference is that the care facilities require medical teams to be deployed, whereas the recovery facilities do not. Right? But other than that, Largely, these are big spaces that we, in, in each space, we're talking about being able to accommodate thousands of patients or residents. I don't have the detailed cost figures, um, but f I mean, in fact, if you look at many of these spaces, the reality is, you know, you, in, in a COVID-19 environment, you are not able to do very much in the expo, right? Or in some of these uh, big sites. And so actually, you're, you're not incurring a lot of uh, opportunity costs there. These space are, space, spaces are going to be empty otherwise. So it's really activating the space, getting that ready. That doesn't cost a lot, but it's also the manpower involved. And like I said, uh, there's a lot of that that's happening, not just on the government side, but also many private sector organizations stepping forward to contribute. I think you also asked about the uh, capacity. Uh, in terms of uh, how many patients they can handle. I mentioned that uh, currently our community care facility is about 10,000 and we're ramping up to 20,000 beds. And uh, each bed uh, can, of course, take one patient, but you have to bear in mind that uh, each patient may stay between 14, 20 days, 21 days, some may be 28 days. So it depends on how long uh, they, are, they, they need to stay in these uh, facilities. The longer they stay, that means I will not be able to admit new patients. So it's a flow uh, issue depending on how fast we can uh, allow the patients to go home and how soon we can discharge them to uh, uh, the community recovery facility I just mentioned. If I can release some of them to the community recovery facility, then the community care facility can admit new patients. So it's uh, also a flow issue and the flow also depends on how long each patient needs to take in these facilities and the length of stay uh, will vary from patient to patient. Some patients are able to recover faster, some may take longer. So it's an issue of how long they will stay and therefore they will determine how many patients we can accommodate. So as we see more patients uh, being diagnosed, being uh, uh, confirmed positive, we are also correspondingly ramping up the capacity for these uh, community care facilities so that we can take care of them in the community. Thank you, Ministers. Our next question will come from Eugene from today. Eugene, you're unmuted. Can you state your question, please? Hi, sorry. Will you guys be reviewing the criteria for isolation of discharge as the numbers go up? And um, can MOH also detail the steps it's taking to ensure the mental well-being of migrant workers, especially those with COVID-19, so that they don't do anything drastic? Are they aware that the government is paying for them? What was the second question? Um, can, you, can you also detail the steps that uh, are being taken to ensure the mental well-being of the migrant workers, especially those with COVID-19, so that they don't do anything drastic? You know, um, are they aware that the government is paying for their stays in the hospitals? Uh, yes, I'll ask uh, uh, Prof Mark to talk about the uh, uh, various uh, reviews that are ongoing on the uh, um, care of the patient and uh, discharge conditions and so on. Uh, but for the uh, mental well-being of the uh, patients, uh, particularly the foreign uh, migrant workers in the dormitories, we are aware of their stress level and their concerns, and we have uh, 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 assigned people to uh, meet them, to discuss with them, and to uh, counsel them. And we also provided hotlines for them to call should they need any assistance including those uh, patients who are in the community care uh, facilities. Uh, we also have uh, uh, ambassadors that will uh, 
uh, engage them, reach out to them, and to have a better understanding of their mental uh, concerns. And if should they have uh, any issues, they are encouraged to uh, reach out to us and uh, to uh, uh, contact us through the hotline and we'll be able to address their mental uh, issues, if any. Uh, to expand on the uh, Minister's uh, uh, answer as well, uh, uh, in fact, we also have community care organisations uh, that partner with the Joint Task Force and uh, various government agencies to reach out to some of these workers to assure them that, in fact, their needs are uh, being looked at, looked into, and their welfare is important to all of us. Uh, they've also been a very useful platform for providing uh, feedback from the workers back to the uh, task force, and we take each uh, of that feedback very seriously. In relation to the first question, uh, we uh, have uh, a policy of continuing to review all our processes, our protocols, our care pathways, and we want to make sure that these uh, are always evidence-based, uh, based on the lit latest literature as well as the latest uh, research that's available. And we also look at uh, our local experience, and that's led us uh, to understand a little bit better about what the uh, cause of disease is for the majority of uh, patients. Uh, through that uh, experience, through the studies that we've done, we've found, in fact, that uh, for many of our patients, uh, they have a very mild clinical cause and they do very well without any uh, additional treatment necessary. Uh, as Minister has mentioned earlier, there's a small proportion that actually need to be admitted into the hospital. But we found that in the uh, uh, care for these patients, uh, the first two weeks is the most critical. And if uh, patients uh, extend beyond the first two weeks, they remain very well and very stable, their likelihood is that they will have a very good clinical outcome. And that's led to our design of our care pathways to allow them to spend that first two weeks in the community care facility and then subsequently allowing them to stay in a community recovery facility to complete their recovery process. We continue also to look at um, the latest evidence to determine whether or not uh, there are ways in which we can improve our uh, sense-making in terms of uh, uh, when uh, they will be ready to return back to the community. And as uh, that information gets available, we will then bring it through and uh, amend our processes accordingly. In fact, there's currently uh, one en uh, engagement that's ongoing with medical experts, particularly the infectious disease diseases uh, experts, in terms of uh, some of the latest evidence and how that would uh, uh, lead us to adjust our policies accordingly. Thank you, panelists. Our next question will come from Sunket from Zaopao. Sunket, can you please ask your question? Good evening, ministers and GMS. We'd like to ask, I understand that there were 14 cases added to Acacia Home yesterday. So even when we consider the cases, there are actually very few community cases in Singapore. So I'm just wondering, does this mean that we can expect our tightened circuit, break, uh, circuit breaker measures to end by May 4th? Um... We've said that we will monitor the community transmission very carefully and look at the numbers daily. Uh, the trend is indeed improving, but uh, we want to be sure that there is a decisive reduction in local tr uh, community transmission before we make any moves to relax the circuit breaker measures, be it on May 4th or after that. All right, so we are still watching. Uh, over the next few days, how uh, the numbers will pan out and unfold, and then we will, as we dis as we review the situation, we will decide um, whether or not there is scope for some easing. I should add that, um, and the numbers are what they are, but the numbers that we see every day are sometimes also uh, a result of the extensive testing that we do. And we are ramping up testing. Uh, we, have, we have been doing this extensively. Uh, we've reported this or we highlighted this yesterday and we said that we are also going to be doing more testing, particularly in vulnerable areas across our nursing homes. For example, the residents, the staff of these nursing homes. As we do these active testing and sweeping of cases, I, I would not be surprised if we find more cases uh, this sweeping of this active testing, active case finding, I will not be surprised if we see more cases popping up. It's, uh, these are what they call cryptic or hidden cases, you know, because these are people with very mild symptoms, maybe even no symptoms at all, but they are in the community. 
they may be self-medicating, thinking that it's just a mild cold and I take a Panadol or I take some flu medicine and it's okay, I rest and it's all right. So there may very well be cases like that in the community which we are not detecting. It's not present, they are not presenting themselves in the system. They are not going to see a doctor. Right? And when we do an active sweep uh, in a particular institution, we may well find more cases. So we will continue to monitor, we will continue to ramp up our testing as we've said we will, and then um, if the situation permits, if the numbers do indeed come down, uh, we will look at relaxing some of the restrictions. Perhaps I should add that um, uh, we do intend to uh, step up our screening, especially for nursing homes and for the vulnerable elders in the seniors in the senior homes. And uh, these uh, 14 cases was actually the result of a comprehensive screening of the Acacia home. And that's why we found these uh, 14 cases. Had we not uh, screened them, we probably would not have uh, discovered them. And in time to come, some of them may fall ill and then we'll discover later. But what it means is, as, uh, as Minister Wong pointed out, as we step up our screening and testing of these uh, vulnerable uh, seniors, you are, you are likely to expect to see more cases being detected which otherwise would, have, would not have been detected if we do not do the screening. And these cases will emerge over the next uh, few days as we step up our screening and testing efforts among these vulnerables. So I think uh, we need to be uh, prepared to see more cases from em emerging from these uh, institutions as we do proactive uh, screening uh, tests for them. Thank you, panelists. Our next question will come from Philip from Bloomberg. Philip, uh, you're up next. Thank you very much. Uh, good to see you all. Hope you're all keeping safe. Um, I guess I just have to ask if the government has uh, any estimates regarding, you know, how many of these migrant workers might inevitably wind up with the infection. Thank you. We do not have a projection because uh, uh, this uh, disease uh, transmission is uh, we are still uh, discovering the signs of how it transmits. And therefore, our focus now is to find out uh, the patients who are infected and provide them with appropriate care as soon as possible. As I mentioned, the priority is really to make sure that they, provide, they are provided with the care and to minimize complications and minimize uh, mortality to the extent possible. And therefore, we are also looking at um, bringing out the uh, workers who are older, who may have underlying conditions, isolate them, uh, protect them, so that they are less exposed to the risk of an infection. So these are the things that we are doing to try to minimize the number of uh, uh, workers that are infected. And it also depends on the management uh, at, the, at the dorm, and we are stepping up our presence in the dormitories to help the local uh, management team to uh, manage the dorms to minimize uh, uh, cross-infection among the workers within the dorms. Can, can I perhaps add that um, if you look at the daily reports and the updates that we put out on the MOH website, we do pr provide uh, statistics on the infection rate for different groups. So you have an infection rate for the migrant workers who are residing in dormitories. You have an infection rate for the work permit holders who are out, living outside dormitories, and then you have an infection rate for locals as well as others within our community itself. Um, and you can see that they are obviously at different levels. Uh, there is consistently, you, from today's data, uh, it's quite clear that the infection rate among migrant workers is higher than the rest of the community because we are dealing with two different infections. And the, dif the infection rate among migrant workers is highest amongst those who are in the construction sector, regardless of whether they are living in dormitories or outside dormitories, the, the, which is the, what we have been uh, explaining about how this, has trans, this um, virus has been transmitted across work sites, across different uh, places of residence amongst this group of workers. Uh, so that's where the evidence is based on the data but what is the true underlying rate of infection? I, I think that's an estimate that, you know, it, it's, it's, you, there will be some projections, but it's very hard to 
accurately pin down. Even within the community, short of very extensive testing, today's infection rate that we are seeing in the general population may be lower than the actual infection rate because, as we said, there may be unlinked cases, uh, hidden cases, very mild cases where people think it's just a normal cough and cold or flu and then they recover and they don't suspect that it's COVID. This is true everywhere in the world. All right, so uh, we, we know what we know from today's data, but we can only know better if we do more extensive testing, which is what we hope to do. Thank you, Ministers. Can we have the next question from Kai from Channel 8? Can you please? Hi. We'd like to check right, how you are going to expand the SG healthcare costs. Uh, in terms of volunteers, right, uh, are you looking at uh, to recruit uh, more cabin crews or any other sector of workers to come and support this? Yeah, in fact, uh, thank you for the question. In fact, uh, all are welcome because uh, going forward, there will be, we will need a lot more uh, help from people. And it, I think it's good for Singaporeans to step forward to join our healthcare call to help us in our healthcare uh, services in support of the uh, uh, infected patients. So we welcome uh, people from all walks of life. If you're interested, sign up with us and we will look for opportunities that you, uh, we can uh, tap on your expertise, your experience, or just simply uh, your willingness uh, to participate in this. So in a, in, in a sense, we welcome anyone who is keen to join, our, join the ranks to volunteer to be a part of the team to take care of our uh, uh, patients and to fight this battle together with us. We have time for three last questions. The next question will come from Nicholas from Yahoo. Nicholas, please ask your question. Hi. Uh, so, our uh, both ministers, uh, Gan and Chan, have spoken about the need to ramp up testing capacity and to carry out mass testing before the circuit breaker can be lifted. Do we know what shape or form this will take? Uh, for example, we see drive-through testing like we've seen in Korea and New York. Uh, are we going to test all Singaporeans or do we have a target figure for, for how many people we want to test? Uh, we do want to test as many as uh, possible, uh, but there's also a natural limit and also some uh, strategic logic to who we test and how we test. And a lot will depend on how we intend to open up uh, the circuit breaker measures, how do we want to release them, and how we uh, roll back the, these circuit breaker measures also depend on how the pandemic uh, pans out over the next uh, few weeks or next few months, depends on when it happens. So we'll need to look at uh, where are the risk areas and where are the areas that are safer to uh, release and open up first. And as we open them, what do we do to make sure that uh, we can open them in a safe way? Say, for example, if we are planning to open certain sectors in the economy to allow some economic activity to, to resume, then we may want to uh, step up the testing of these uh, essential workers that are in these economies. They may no longer be bare essentials. There may be additional economic activities that are important, and the, there may be additional workers that have to go back to the workforce, and we need to find a way to make sure that they can return safely. It may be done through testing, may be done through... Uh, quarantine or isolation or stay home notices or other measures. So they all work together to ensure a safe way of uh, 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 re uh, reducing or rolling back some of these uh, circuit measures. And how we do so depends to a very large extent on how the uh, uh, crisis, how the infection will pan out over the next uh, few weeks. And we are monitoring the situation. And as we monitor, we are, we are uh, working on plans to how to re return to a more a normal uh, situation? How do you do a, a achieve a more sustainable way of uh, uh, a situation while maintaining some safe distancing? Some of the uh, circuit breaker measures may have to uh, maintain so as to ensure uh, safety among all of us. So I think it is a part of the plan that we are uh, now working on and it will include how to do so in a safe way and testing will play a very critical part in this uh, area. So one example, as I mentioned, is we may decide to te test a selective group of uh, workers and do we test them every day, which I think may not be possible. Do we test them regularly and how frequent do we need to test them will all be part and parcel of this uh, plan for us to be able to uh, roll back some of the uh, circuit breaker measures. If some of the measures uh, uh, that we roll back do not in, uh, involve high-risk areas, we may not need 
to employ testing, we may just need to step up some of the safe distancing measures as we do so. I would just add, because you had asked about the different types of testing, um, we are going to expand our testing capacity. We are looking at different new testing technologies. The main test that is administered for COVID-19 now is a PCR test. Um, it takes time, it's complex, you need a lab, you need to run it through the lab. People are now developing faster point-of-care tests. So we'll, we will examine all of these technologies as they come to the market, and then we will look at expanding the full suite of testing capabilities. Even with an existing PCR test, there are innovative things you can do. You can do what they call pool testing, not one test for one individual, but batch, so that even if you have a limited number of tests that you can administer a day, you can multiply the number of tests that you can do by pool testing. So these are different techniques that we can do on the testing front uh, in order to achieve the results we want. But as Minister Gan said, testing is just one part of the overall strategy to allow us to safely resume activities. Uh, it will have to be complemented with many other measures, whether it's quarantine, whether it's safe distancing, as well as um, one thing I mentioned yesterday during the, um, the uh, press conference, which is uh, um, the use of technology for more uh, faster contact tracing. We are already doing some of that, but we think there is scope to go beyond what we have today. And so we are working out some applications for faster, more effective contact tracing, which we hope to roll out soon. Thank you, Ministers. Can we have the next question from CT from Kyoto News? CT, please ask your question. Hi, thank you very much. Uh, I just want to ask about Singapore's uh, low mortality rate compared with other countries. Uh, of course, it has been mentioned like, today. I mean, uh, they have uh, most of the patients have very mild form of infection. Uh, but nevertheless, I'd like to know your take on why you think Singapore has this low mortality rate. Thank you very much for that question. And in, f in fact, uh, uh, we've been fortunate uh, that uh, at this point in time, we have seen uh, many of our patients with COVID-19 infection uh, having a very mild cause and doing well. Uh, it's probably a result of several different factors. One, of course, is the fact that we have uh, a number of quite young individuals who are present within our patient population. And, and we do know, and this is the same experience from overseas, that younger patients tend to do much better. The older patients have increased risk of complications, as well as uh, having to require ICU care and even uh, uh, higher uh, risk of uh, dying. Uh, but it's also partly because of our approach in terms of how we want to identify those at increased risk of getting uh, infected and having a bad outcome, and then trying to remove them from that environment where they are they at increased risk of being exposed to the virus and trying to keep them safe. So we do have a policy of trying as best as we can to remove those individuals who we think may have an increased risk for a bad outcome away uh, from the rest of, uh, of, uh, of uh, the workers who might be symptomatic or infected in the dormitories. We try and uh, trying to remove, reduce that um, potential for exposure and therefore to uh, reduce their chances of getting infected. Notwithstanding these efforts, it's important to recognize that even if we have a, a predominantly healthy population of people who may be getting infected with COVID-19 infection, there will be some people who may not do well. And it's important for us to be aware of that and to, uh, to expect that some would in fact would have complications, some may end up in the ICU and some may even die. And it's therefore uh, our, uh, important for us to keep a close watch, look for people who are deteriorating, get to them as soon as is possible, uh, look after them as best as we can, and even then, there's always that possibility that they may not do well. Thank you, panelists. Our last question of the day will come from Venga from TM. Venga, please ask your question. Uh, hi, uh, Venga from TM here. So there are some uh, photos circulating online of uh, the food that is being given to workers uh, in dormitories currently. Uh, so some of them are not really liking the food, but I understand that the interagency task force has taken great efforts to make sure that they get their daily meals. 
uh, but you know, still some of the workers aren't uh, really fond of the standard of the food, and especially now that it's uh, the month of Ramadan. Uh, you know, a lot of uh, these Muslim workers, for them, the food is uh, a very key uh, priority for them. So, uh, perhaps, are there any uh, measures to sort of uh, uh, maintain or improve the standard of food or, or to check the standards of food that uh, are being given to these workers currently? Yeah, thank you. Um, yes, certainly, it's a feedback that we've received too, particularly in the initial period uh, when there was a massive logistics exercise to, to cater food to all these workers because they are used to preparing their own food in their dormitories but we put a stop to communal uh, activities in order to en enforce safe distancing so the exercise of um, ramping up the catering to provide to workers not only in the dormitories but in the care facilities as well has been a huge undertaking and there has been constant feedback with the uh, food caterers, SATs and others. Uh, and based on that feedback, my understanding from the feedback we've received from the residents in the care facilities and also from the workers in the dormitories is that the quality has improved. And many of the initial issues that were raised have been addressed by the caterers. We are also very mindful that in the month of Ramadan where Muslims are fasting, that then we need to make some adjustments, so provide bigger portions uh, you know, when they break fast, provide them with something suitable when they break fast, and then something perhaps uh, more when, uh, early in the morning. So these are uh, issues that the caterers, the teams on the ground are very mindful of, and that's why they have been constantly making these adjustments in response to the feedback from the workers. Thank you, ministers and panelists, for your time today. And thank you, everyone, for attending today's press conference.